Ceiling Unlimited. Hello, Americans. This is Orson Welles. This radio show is brought to you by the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. I'm speaking to you from the main waiting room at the LaGuardia Airport, New York City. The date, by the way, is February 1st, 1946. Boston, Halifax, Belfast, Liverpool, and London. All aboard. Amazon Express leaving at gate three in five minutes. Have a good trip, honey. Have you forgotten anything? No, I don't think so. Did you pack my raincoat and the big bag? Yes, and your Palm Beach suit and your heavy underwear. Oh, yes, and your dress suits and the small trunk along with your white flannels and warm woolly top coat. You'll be back tomorrow night. Yes, I have to stop at Rio on the way back. Herrera lives four or five hundred miles out of town. You know air cabs. Takes them half a day to find a number, even if it is painted all over the roof. Daylight Limited for Cairo, Egypt, leaving on runway 82 in five minutes. Is that my plane, the Daylight Limited? I'm going on to Cairo. Yes, madam. May I see your ticket, please? West Africa Special, leaving on runway 54. Now, please be sure and remember to return Mrs. Amajo's bag in Buenos Aires. She forgot it last weekend. All in order, madam. Gate 82. You're sure we won't need a passport? Oh, no. All that will be necessary is your certificate of health. Oh, uh, but we're going on from Cairo. We're going clear around the world. Won't we need a passport anywhere? Oh, no, madam. Passports were abolished during the Second World's Congress. Arctic Express, last well, call. Well, of course, I knew that, but I thought maybe uh, what I meant to say is we don't want to run into any wars or anything like that in some uncivilized part of the globe. Well, there hasn't been a war since 19... 19- I beg your pardon, but when's the next plane for Moscow? Oh, there's a London's Commuter Express leaving in three and a half minutes, sir. You can change in England. Say, I left my commutation ticket at home this morning. Can I buy a one-way ticket? Eastern Express making connections for India at gate nine. Word about the South American Express. I'm not taking it, don't you remember? I have to go to Lisbon first. Oh, of course, that's why you took your raincoat. Well, have fun, and I'll see you tomorrow night, unless you call. I've got a month vacation coming up in July. I think I'll take the family over. Got an eight-year-old boy who's never been to China. Australia special, leaving in three minutes, gate six. Last call for Daylight Limited. Hear me, I'd better hustle. Oh, take the pneumatic conveyor to runway 32, madam. You've plenty of time. Landing strip's only two miles away. You be careful flying back home, and please, dear, watch what you're doing when you put the plane in the garage. Uh, Goodbye, darling. Nineteen forty-six. Honolulu's an overnight hop from Chicago. You can fly the Pacific for a set and a half a mile, and if you want to impress your girlfriend, buy her a quarter's worth of orchids flown up this morning from Brazil. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a radio broadcast, but it isn't a hoax. Any resemblance to the men from Mars is purely accidental. It may interest you to know that everything, absolutely everything you've heard in the past couple of minutes, no matter how fictional it seems, is entirely possible. Not next year or in 1946 or 1950, but right now. These aren't wild pipe dreams of blueprints or pulp magazine stuff. For months, the machinery which would make these miracles possible has been rolling off aircraft assembly lines. Just now, of course, our airplanes have more important things to do than to take you to Rio for a weekend. All right. You know what to do. Sure. Down the funnel. Let her rip. Hold your hats, gentlemen. Steady. Steady as you go. Bombs away. Solid, Jackson. <laughs> that Jap battleship is one dead duck. That's it, gang. Everybody bail out. Motors. Well, how about you, Cap? Take care of yourself. Don't worry about me. jump clear. But the pilot never had time to bail out. Somehow you can't help wondering if anything, even a Japanese battleship, is worth the life of a man like Colin Kelly, Jr. In the conviction that the service and example of Captain Colin P. Kelly, Jr. will be long remembered, I ask for this consideration in behalf 
of Colin P. Kelly III. That's the passport to an education for Corky Kelly, age three, signed by the President of the United States. And that answers the questions, really. All the suffering and sacrifice, it does pay off and make sense on one condition. If it means a better world for Colin P. Kelly III. This program is about tomorrow. A.W., children call it. After the war. You've seen those hopeful, happy ads showing some man of the future shopping in his small town sales hangar for a new plane. Those ads are true because we're going to win the war and there will be airplanes instead of as well as cars for people to ride in. Plain people, little people. But still, is this man you? Could be my Joe a few years from now. He's in Guadalcanal. That's where he is, I, I think. Always crazy to fly. Never had the chance yet. Or it could be an Eskimo ice fisher in Unalaska, a gland patient in a Texas sanatorium, a diver in a San Francisco harbor, a county doctor back in the Mississippi swamplands. Yeah, or me, for instance. I got me a little um, sheep ranch up in North Dakota. The wife, she's a Bible woman. Also what you might call literal-minded. And when the book tells her, love thy neighbor, it irks her she only gets a chance to do it three or four times a year. That's when we make the trip to Chickasaw for supplies, meet the Davises that live just around Bear Point, 70 miles up the pass. I got a hunch it ain't just because she feels it her duty. She really does enjoy it when her and Mrs. Davis get together, give each other potholders they've crocheted, and swap yarns about what they've been cooking the last few months. I know Harry Davis and me has a good time. After the buy-in's done, it's a glass of beer here and chocolate bar there. And always, uh, no, no, it's got to be my treat now. Till before you know it, it's late afternoon, time to be getting back. Now, the way you were talking, why, I suppose we could be real neighborly. <laughs> Just fly across like how to do and visit the Davises at their place. Oh, yes, you could be neighborly. This earth would bow, furling its mountains and its miles while you slipped over to call on the Davises. There'd be other neighbors for you, too, down in Colorado, over in Ontario. Distances cease to be the limbo beyond Chickasaw Corners. Become just the swift little breezes sparkling past your wings. The advertisement, that picture of the man, whoever he is, buying his little plane becomes an expanding dream the transports, tomorrow's work planes, flying that Eskimo to the University of Chicago, beating death to the bedside of that country doctor's patient, higher and swifter, flashing through the dead shadows of national boundaries and man's abject isolation from his neighbor. But, Mr. Wells, how do we know our kids are going to be better off? How do we know it isn't going to happen all over again in another 20 years? Worse than the last time. What are we really fighting for? Well, that's the biggest question in the world, which doesn't mean we shouldn't try to answer it. Please turn to page three of Time magazine for November 9th, 1942. Got it? Mm-hmm. Read it. What kind of a world are we fighting for? That's the lead line in the two-page advertisement of Pan American World Airways. Herewith, we present a statement written for Americans and people throughout the world by the Most Reverend William Temple, the Archbishop of Canterbury. The structure of life as we knew it before the war has already been profoundly modified. How far do we want to restore it if we can? I offer these suggestions as a goal to aim at immediately. Every child should find itself a member of a family housed with decency and dignity so that it may grow up in a happy fellowship unspoiled by underfeeding or overcrowding, by dirty and drab surroundings or by mechanical monotony of environment. Every citizen should have a voice in the conduct of the business of industry which is carried on by means of his labor and the satisfaction of knowing that his labor is directed to the well-being of the community. 
After the war, every citizen should have sufficient daily leisure with two days of rest in seven and an annual holiday with pay to enable him to enjoy a full personal life. Every citizen should have assured liberty in the forms of freedom of worship, of speech, of assembly, and of association for special purposes. That's what the spiritual head of the Church of England has to say about the world for Corky Kelly. What keeps us from realizing that world? Here's America, the world's granary. But the hungry people don't get the grain. America is the world's hospital, but the patients don't arrive in time. America is the world's university, but the students can't enroll. Ever since the beginning of time, our fruitful heritage has been knotted up, congested, blocked, because the trade avenues were so narrow. The road from Sao Paulo to Archangel, from Des Moines to Hankow, was never wide enough or fast enough. Well, it is now. You've heard that sound many times on this program. It's a simple sound effect. We've tried to make it more than that. We nominate that noise as a flag for the future, a trumpet call announcing tomorrow, the day to come when the bomb sites are dismantled and the guns are taken off and the steel armor removed and man, the common man whose century this is to be, rebuilds his cities tomorrow. Just between us, Corky, I'd swap lifetimes with you, sight unseen. gentlemen. This series of broadcasts is continuing at this same time. But for a while, the Mercury Theater is going off the air. Next week, my friend Ronald Coleman will tell you the story about Douglas Dauntless, the world's greatest dive bomber. We very much wish it were possible for us to go on writing and producing these radio plays. We've never been happier. We've never been as proud of an association in any medium, any time in our life as a theater company. The Mercury is proud to have been part of a great industry. We're proud of the men and women of Lockheed and Vega. We leave with real regrets. It's not easy this time to say good night, Americans. This program has come to you from the Lockheed and Vega Aircraft Corporations of Burbank, California. Be with us again next Monday night when Ronald Coleman tells the story of the Douglas Dauntless. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.